Okay, hello everybody. It's 7 p.m. sharp in Finland, so let's begin. Welcome to XYZ Masterclass on Finnish success stories in American and international market from acquisition to distribution. I'm Fanny Heinonen from Film Tampere, that is a regional film commission in Finland, Tampere. This is the third year we arranged these masterclasses together with Los Angeles-based XYZ Films, and this masterclass is the second of the year. As we all know, this year has been a successful one for Finnish productions. And today we will especially focus on two films, Hatching and Sisu. And a side note about Sisu, um, the production received Film Tampere's production incentive and the visual effects of the film were made by a Tampere-based VFX house, Troll VFX. Big thanks, Troll, for making a great job. And thank you, Team Sisu, for letting Film Tampere be part of your journey. And of course, huge congratulations for both of the productions for making Finland on the global map. Before we start, uh, uh, I want to thank the Ministry of Education and Culture for funding this, these masterclasses via Next Generation EU Fund. Without your support, these masterclasses wouldn't be possible. So big thank you. And for the audience to know, we will have a Q&A section in the end of the masterclass when you're allowed to ask questions and share comments. But if there's anything you want to know uh, or comment during the panel, you're allowed to um, uh, write in the chat box. So uh, Todd, our moderator, will take it from there. The masterclass will be recorded and the recording will be sent to your emails after the masterclass within two days. But now the best part, <laughs> warmly welcome our amazing panelists, Scott Schumann, Head of Acquisitions, IFC Films, New York, welcome. Mike Goodrich, founder at Good Chaos from UK and executive producer of CISU. And Petra Jokiranta, producer at Soup Zero Film Entertainment and producer of CISU. And of course, our fantastic moderator, Todd Brown, the Head of Acquisitions at XYZ Films. Welcome on board, and uh, I hope that you all are as excited as I am. So now, just uh, have a seat, lean back, and enjoy the masterclass. Todd, please, you can take it from here. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and to just to, to to reiterate what Fanny said earlier, um, for for people that are watching this, I mean, we're. I like to do these things in a way that are fairly informal and much more a conversation as opposed to being a lecture or or something like that. Um, I mean, everybody on this panel or people like we've all known each other for a while. Um, so hopefully it will be fairly kind of free flowing and, and comfortable and casual and sincerely, the whole point of doing this is for you, the people that are watching and engaging and for you to understand and uh, if we're saying things that aren't making sense or if we've said something that is that you think is interesting and you would like some further clarification or you would like to, to go a little bit deeper into that, please do not be shy about using the chat box. Um, we, are, we are here for you, not for us. Um, so I'm very, very happy to kind of go down those roads. Uh, I do have like a framework of things for us to talk about, but very, very happy to kind of break from that kind of if and as needed. Um, the thinking on this going forward um, and to talk about it is, is really to talk about success and, and, and to celebrate success uh, and look at the things that have worked on, on these particular films. What is it about hatching that made it really work in the marketplace? What is it about Sisu that made it really work in the marketplace? Because both of them really did. Um, so for the most part, um, I do want to talk about things through that lens and what are what are the things that we should be targeting and aiming for. But I do think it's worth talking about general context of the marketplace um, and kind of the things that things are are living within. So I think beginning, uh, Scott, I think a lot a lot of this is going to come to you from the distribution side of things uh, on on the American side of the industry. And you've worked across like at the studio level, you've worked in the agencies, you've worked now kind of in, in a more traditionally indie focused company and, and, and a more internationally focused company. But for you, when you're looking at things, um, how big a barrier is language really? And what percentage, if, if you were to ballpark, what percentage of 
non-English films even have the chance? Um, where would you say that cut line is? Well, even has a chance is a tough way to categorize it. But <laughs> what what I would say is um, you, certain themes are universal and certain themes are slightly more regional. And I think if there are things in a film that play to regional politics or regional subcultures or regional um, just just feel when we see something that feels like it belongs in a certain place and doesn't have a certain level of universality to it, it's a little tough. But there are universal things in the world that we see in films, family, love, action, scares. Humor is oddly not universal, something that uh, I would say, like, um, I've, I've never found a German film funny. <laughs> um, and I'm sure they're hysterical, but it's a very regional type of comedy. And I think certain I'm, French I'm comedies- and, I'm, I'm half German and no, they're not. Yeah, but I think like certain like <laughs> French comedies that the, the France has a very healthy theatrical box office and you see these comedies that do just unbelievable business. And they don't travel like a, like a, I would say like a, a Danny Boone comedy might not travel as well as something like, um, what was the Omar Sy movie? Uh, the, 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 Untouchables, the Untouchables, which traveled everywhere because the themes and what it said was slightly more universal. So I would say what gives something a chance to travel and that's a feeling that people all over the world can connect with it. Now, the United States is one territory, is one very specific territory with very specific uh, theatrical and ancillary circumstance. What happens in the United States is not necessarily reflective of what's happening in other places in the world right now. Um, international films are, uh, in the United States, traditionally were very well attended by an older film going audience in theaters. The older film going audience since COVID has not been as aggressive in returning to the theater as a younger, more blockbuster oriented or more genre oriented audience has. So when you look at the barrier of language, we look at trends, we look at how, how consumers are acting and how people are responding to different types of films. So when we see things like genre films working, we say language is less of a barrier now in, in, a, in a shrinking world than it's ever been before, I think. But what are those things that are cool? Like Sisu, for example, is a movie that like action translates, it tra translates everywhere. Like it's really like, it's got themes that I think n no one could watch that movie and say like, I don't get it. Like it makes sense. And I think with genre films, like Hatching has a very high concept to it. And with a high concept, which we can easily capture on a poster with a little girl and a giant egg and a kind of creature hand in that egg, we can capture something that kind of transcends uh, the language barrier. Yeah, and I mean, you talked about this a little bit, but when the importance of genre, in this, um, I mean, it's a space that we work in a lot and, and specifically part of it is because like that horror audience or the genre audience tends to be very, very proactive uh, and, and want a new experience. Uh, how, how much does that shift the metric for you when you're looking at things? Uh, these days, a lot. I think as we look at what is working and just we try to both react to the consumer and lead the consumer, I think stuff that's working are genre mashups, things that are not just a, a, a old fashioned traditional period drama, which used to work very well. They're having a tougher time. So what we look for is stuff that's interesting, unique, does something that we haven't seen before, regardless of language, and you know has an interesting blend of genres to it. Because I think um, that that's what uh, the, the fewer words you have to translate as, as much as language isn't a barrier, like genre films, like 
the stuff that's happening, you don't necessarily need to read the subtitles. Like in a genre film, you know when someone's scared, when someone when someone's angry, when someone's in danger. Like these are the things that um, I think just translate beyond language. Yeah. Now, Petri, through I mean your your more recent work, you're obviously very very closely linked with with the, with the Almari's films, um, but even before that. It, it certainly feels like you've always had ambitions that are larger than just Finland. Uh, I mean, you make very Finnish films, but you've but you've been looking much broader for a long time, um, and and really pushing those boundaries. What are what are the things that you are looking for when you're looking at filmmakers and and projects? Well, uh, I met Yalmari was it 2007, and and. Uh, um, uh we had a, a dream that someday we have a film that could be released widely in us and after 10 years it happened so basically now, now we have sisu and it, it it's a, it was a, it was a wide release and it went well and and um when it comes to yamari as a director i think um yamari uh is definitely thinking himself as a filmmaker that that uh, is doing films uh, audiences all over the world, not not only in Finland. And I myself as a producer, uh, I found out that this Finnish language market is is quite small. So so basically it it, it, uh, it doesn't make sense to do Finnish language films only. And, and uh, I decided then when I met Yamari in 2007 that, okay, uh, we should start creating uh, stories that really can travel. And, and uh, the first one was Yamari's re-exports, the story about this um, scary Finnish Santa Claus, the haunt creature. And it was a horror film. And it was also like a little bit like Amblin, Steven Spielberg kind of, film and it was Finnish language film uh, but it still traveled and and uh and commercially it was it was really okay and, and also it was great first feature film for the director and then we did a big game and and uh that was already was it uh almost 10 million dollar the budget and we had big stars there like Samuel Jackson and, and uh Jim Broadbent and uh that was um uh, uh well learning experience in good and bad and and uh, <laughs> basically it was uh both films were exports and and became uh we uh we learned that uh those films were a little bit difficult to to position into market because uh, uh unlike sisu which is a very uh, straightforward action film they were like like uh, uh, films for uh, not 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 for family, but but uh, uh, and they were rated like PG thirteen or something, and the, in the end the core audience target audience was uh, was not not that big, but when it comes to Sisu, it, it's it's uh, action film R rated and and um, it was, I mean much easier to position that film. And and uh, and I'm pretty sure that the next film what we are doing will be something like Sisu. It will be action film, and, uh, and the, all the films we've done are high concepts, and they they are also genre films. And I think uh, there's bigger markets, definitely for for genre films. Also, it's it's probably a little bit easier to find us genre films than than than. Uh, uh dramas or local dramas or even if they are english language films so, so um well that's that's the trouble we've had and and uh and now we succeeded to do the film that is is released theatrically well all over the world yeah um this is starting with using sisu as the example but i think this also applies just as well to hatching as kind of for all of you. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting using Yamari as an example again, um, I mean, obviously right from the beginning with Rare Exports, there was a level of polish 
and kind of technical stuff to what he does that the American industry came knocking. He's had agency representation. I, I, for sure, he's being sent scripts all the time and he turns them all down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's your, your films are targeting an international audience, but in a way that remains very true to who you are and, and where you've come from. I think all three of mm -hmm. them unmistakably finish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's explicit in the setting. Um, and, I, and I'm curious from all of you, you know, I remember the years when I first came in and I mean, Mike, you would have experienced this as a protagonist and as a journalist before that and at festivals, you know, people talking about like the Euro pudding movie and, and the idea that people were cobbling things together in a way that was trying to be for wide appeal, but the way they would do that was to take all of the local edges off of it um, and, and pull a lot of the personality out in a way to try to not alienate. And what they were left with was something that was incredibly unspecific and that wouldn't draw people. And I think one of the things that you've done and one of the things that Hatching did is they made things, they found a way of having appeal while also being really specific um, and, and then leveraging that to, to draw an audience in. I'm, I'm curious for all of your thoughts on that, like a, from, from a production standpoint, from a creative standpoint, from a distribution standpoint. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking, you know, if I'm going to make a movie that appeals to America, I have to make a movie that feels like an American film. And yeah, I think with 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 Sisu, we had in the in the early stages when we first read the script, we had the challenge of um, or the benefit, actually, the opportunity of not having much dialogue in it. Um, so. You know, we knew that there were a couple of Finnish lines in it. There was some German speaking, and we we made the decision to to have the Germans speak English. Um, and most of the film, of course, is is silent or non-verbal. Um, and the script read like that. And and we realized that we did have a shot at kind of um having an international film completely organically um and effectively, if as long as we just got the German dialogue as English, which was which is what we did. Um, and I think that really benefited um, in the in the international um, acquisition and release of the film. Um, having said that, you know, the title is is such an exclusively Finnish <laughs> expression <laughs> and word. And Petri, you'll you'll remember this. We you know there were long conversations about keeping that title. You know, I think Yamri really wanted to keep that title. Yeah, we and, all. And yeah. Sony and Lionsgate went along with that, which was kind of cool, really, because it it it, it um, identifies it as something very specifically local, um, but with an international flavor to it. You know. Yeah. By the way, I'm watching a, a fantastic Euro pudding TV series at the moment called The Swarm. Have you have you seen that? Have you heard about it? I've heard about it. I haven't watched it yet. Where everybody has different accents. The German characters have different accents to the French characters. It's quite marvelous. It, it's, it makes me nostalgic about the Euro puddings of old, but they're definitely a thing of the past. Yeah. We, we had this... Uh conversation as Mike told with, with Sony that what will be the title and we have uh, was it like Immortal was one of the titles and yeah, which we'd provided I think hadn't we yeah and then it was a Guts and, and uh, Gruit <laughs> yeah but then I mean we, in the end uh, well Yalmari definitely wanted to have CISO as a title worldwide and, and I think it was a clever thing to do because our film is, in, in a way, it it, um, it it says that it's it's a word that cannot be translated, and it's a very core of the the whole story that this attitude of Sisu. So so basically, I think it was a great thing to have this title. In the end, yeah. Um, a question coming in from. From the audience that's related to this that I think is uh, quite interesting. Um, and in the case of CC, I think this ties back to the German question and there's a, there's a very specific reason on, on the German one, but um, it's from Anastasia. Uh, when, when, the when you have characters from another country, whether the UK or France or Germany or Sweden, um, taking part in a script which is set in Finland, 
do you find that that will help attract distributors from those countries? Um, you know, I know in the case of Sisu, that there was a very specific reason why the Germans were, were speaking English. Um, but say like in big game, I know that's part of the thinking in terms of bringing in um, English speaking actors. I know um, with the new film from the Hatching team, uh, there is gonna be a language mix partly for that reason. Um, Scott, do you do you find that from a distribution side, if you have some some characters that are organically speaking English, how how big a help is that? It's a help. So, um, for example, we have a film right now that we're working on that is a third in French, third in Thai, and a third in English, and we are going to cut an English language trailer from it. So, the marketing materials will all be in English but the film is only a third in English. I don't know if that's a cheat. It's, it's, it's a hand-to-hand -hand combat movie, but it's something that one of the platforms that we partner with asked us for. So that's how the marketing materials will look. So does it help? Yes, I think consumers um, have a perception in their mind that it's a little bit like homework to read subtitles. But I think once they're along for the ride, they don't mind. So it's just getting the, them over that initial hurdle of deciding to consume something. And once they're in the process, you know, like I, I don't think they mind as, as much. So it's just the enticement that it's very helpful with. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you wanna talk about the German versus English speaking with the Germans? Listen, I, I, from my experience when I was selling films, I think there's this misconception that you can you can win over a territory. You know, I remember we sold a film set in France, um, which was in English, and all the producers thought we could sell it into France very easily. But on the contrary, the French really resisted it. Then they weren't interested in in foreigners taking a view on their country. You know, which actually is fair enough if you think of of you know a bunch of a bunch of german people coming to england i can tell you that the english wouldn't be interested in it so um we, we do sort of take very simplistic views on how people speaking english can help i think um and we shouldn't take it for take make assumptions on audience i would say actually in this day and age and it's the same in the tv world that the more locally authentic you are in certain genres the better chance you have to travel yeah, I, I share that opinion. Um, and similarly to, to Scott, if, if I can throw a, a recent XYZ example in, we, we did a Dutch feature, uh, a debut horror film called Moloch, um, which is, it's 60-40 Dutch and English. Um, but the reason that there's English in it is one of the characters in the film um, is uh, an archeological researcher leading a dig team um, who's Danish, um, working in the peat bogs uh, in the Netherlands. And so with, within the body of the film, everybody just behaves like Europeans behave. And whenever the guy who doesn't speak Dutch is in the scene, everybody naturally switches to English because it's the shared common language and it fits organically. Um, but like your film, um, we were fortunate in that one that all the major plot points of the film happened to be delivered in English, which was not a deliberate thing in, in the script writing but it gave us the ability to cut a sales promo that was totally in English. And everybody knew it was a majority Dutch film. We didn't pretend that it wasn't, um, but it let us cut a thing that had appeal that actually the Dutch distributor used as the spine of their own trailer. Um, which yeah, was I think a really interesting experience to see the Dutch use the, the international trailer that really minimized their own language. Yeah. Mm. As long as there's an organic way for the characters to speak English that feels legitimate, that's great. It's when it doesn't feel organic that it really bumps. We'll, like when we're, you know, when we're looking at a film where, say, it's set in Finland and it's a bunch of Finnish characters and they're all speaking in English, we're kind of like, would that really happen? It just doesn't ring true. Um, versus, you know, if there is a kind of natural story uh, reason that they are speaking English. Yeah. 
Um, Petri, again, a, a somewhat related question uh, from Timo. Um, you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier with Big Game, that there were both positive and negative learning experiences there. Um, do you feel like you got bang for the buck by, by having Sam Jackson in that film? Did it, did it play the way you thought it would? Yeah, I think we, Yalmari and I, it was our first time when we had such a big star in our movie and it it was uh, uh well let's say that that um Yalmer probably had had uh more difficult with sam jackson because i mean sam jackson definitely i mean he's a professional he's know what he's doing and, and uh and basically Yalmari uh, uh well he couldn't explain everything he wanted to sam that that uh, what kind of character this is this uh this american president is and and, and so forth and and uh, so I, I think it was uh, a bit stressful for yamari uh dealing with such a big star for the first time but then again i mean uh, uh, that was the uh, we have a 10 million dollar budget and and uh, sam jackson was um, the element financing the budget that that high and obviously uh i mean it helped distributing the film well but uh, actually uh when we started to uh create sisu story or yeah when Elmer started to write it it was a, a stage where uh, we had a, a sci-fi comedy the shooting was uh, was set uh, to Canada and Finland, and Mike was already involved in that film as well. And and uh, we all get really frustrated when COVID came, and and uh, and then then we had to figure out something that we can't just sit on our asses for a couple of years waiting for what, what will happen. And 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 then it, uh, we decided, okay, let's have a production that we are able to do uh, shoot entirely in Finland, and and uh, also the budget level is. It's like something six million that we don't need big stars, but we are able to finance it in a way that that it, it's uh, it's uh, because a casting film nowadays it takes time and it is probably the most difficult part of the, the whole pre-production. And uh, that's how Sisu uh, started. That that okay, we have a production which we are able to finance uh, partly locally using public funds and then then the rest we have to find uh, either the big equity or multi-territorial distributor involved and and uh, we we managed to get bidding war mike that there was yeah. uh, there was a streamers involved and and a couple of studios and then in the end sony was definitely i mean uh probably the most supportive to yalamari that that they they get an idea of what we are all doing and and, uh, and and we decided that okay let's let's do it with sony and it was the first negative pickup deal what uh probably was done with finland so that was also a nice learning experience yes but anyway so we, we this issue production was uh, structured in a way that we don't need big stars like samuel jackson uh, Mike or Scott, just uh, quickly, because I assume there are going to be a bunch of people watching this who won't be familiar with the term. Can one of you explain what a negative pickup deal is? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's when it's when somebody's buying rights in the film, but without without creative control, I would say, without being a studio produced film. So in this case, we sold most of the films territories to Sony including North America um but they were they were pre essentially financing the film by pre-buying all those rights mm -hmm. but there weren't Sony executives visiting our set or, or um mm -hmm. um giving us pressure on what to what to do and what not to do it was still an independent movie an yeah Europe, European movie yeah so like again it's like the distinction between a license and and a commission. Exactly. 
Well, I would also add that the buyer doesn't take on the financial risk. Yes. Whereas yeah. when Good you're point. doing a negative pickup, the person who's making the movie is responsible for the financials of making the movie. And they just get whatever that pre-negotiated amount is. Mm -hmm. And it so studios use it with an understanding they may not have uh, creative control, but they don't, also don't have the financial liability. The producer needs to cash flow this um, MG. Yeah, from the bank. Um, some of the questions coming in, and it's actually ties to where I was gonna gonna move from here is in terms of kind of engaging internationally uh, and what that process looks like. Um, so, I, and I think the answers to this will be fairly different. Let's Scott, let's start with you. When you're looking at kind of international material, kind of at what stage are you typically looking at it? Or as as a buyer, what what needs to be there for you to be able to engage? So um, it's always better for us to wait and see, and we will wait as long as we can for the most part before engaging on a film because making movies is really hard and a lot can go wrong in the process. So for us, because when you look at the international landscape there are more movies to choose from than there are on the domestic landscape. Like as far as movies that are put together in the United States, I don't know, there's a few hundred a year. Internationally, there's a few thousand a year that we have to sit through. So um, we use festivals, both I would say for, for all types of films, we use festivals essentially to screen and as a validation and as a filter for us to understand what we should be focusing our attention on because there's not enough hours in the day to watch all the international films. But we are very director driven. So if it is a director we've been in business with before or a director that we um, have had our eyes on and appreciated their work before, that's usually the scenario where we will hop on board early if it's a director or filmmaker that we're really interested in being in business with. But even in those circumstances, when it's a director that we've worked with before that we're very interested and we love a film, we will sit there and say, we love this film. We want you to make as much money as possible. We would love to see the film. If you're going to sell it, tell us if you're going to sell it and we're in a slightly unique position because of our reputation where we can say if you want to sell it for a lot of money great like before it's done if you want to wait until it's done great we'd love to see it then um we are not um when someone sells a movie to another company we're sad but we're also happy that they hopefully got the most money for the film um because it's not one picture and then we're never gonna work with this person again this is a marathon we're gonna have many opportunities to work with these people so we just want to be pleasant to deal with the you know like treat every film with respect and focus the attention and a lot of its timing as well we are right now planning our 2025 like we're pretty much full for 2023 we have most of our movies for 2024 so the timing of what someone may be working on and when they need to sell it may not work with us just based on how we're set up and organized and, and how we approach the business. So there's a lot of circumstances that are beyond any individual filmmakers control that even affect the timing and when we get involved in something. And then Mike and Petri, same same basic question, but from the production side, when you're when you're developing an idea out, you think, okay, this is something that could have international legs. Petri, when do you start approaching people? You know, Mike, when did when did you get involved? Um, and at what point do you start taking it outside your own inner circle? Well, uh, I am a, we've been lucky to find good team around our movies that, that uh, when we uh, did way exports, uh, it was um, I was looking for a sales company, and, and Gregor Melin uh, just established his uh, company, Kinology, then. And, and uh, we were, there was no big slate. Uh, I mean, we were on, on top of that slate of Gregory. And, and um, I mean, he did really good selling. And, and uh, also, the same thing happened with Big Game that, that uh, Will Clark was just establishing his company, Altitude at that time and, and uh, 
and they they sold our our big game they acted as sales company and, and now Jalmari and I thought that okay let's don't have a sales company let's try to find a person that has this background and knows the markets really well because I as a producer uh I I do understand market but I don't have this current information that that what is the I mean if you if you are dealing with studio that what will be the level of uh MG you are able to get at that certain point and then we met Yamari uh, sorry Mike and and uh and, and I think Mike has been really helpful now when, when we started to position the film into market and uh, because Mike has this background as a sales, sales yeah and I think you know Yamari is is a, a pretty successful director I mean everybody knows where our exports and big game they were both very successful internationally um for what for you know in, in relative terms I think Big game was very big um, on its post in its post theatrical life. Um, so for me, it was very straightforward to a commercial proposition. And one pressure on the film, unfortunately, was timing um, because we got the script, I think, in December or January 21, December 20 and January 21. And we had a weather issue. So we had kind of had to shoot in Lapland. Is that right, Petri? Before the end of October. Yeah, it was Yamari started to write, uh, putting up first things on paper. It was uh, something like September 2020. And, and, and then, then it took um, four months and we had a third version of script. And then we started financing the film. And there was, uh, as, I, as I said, there was this um, a couple of streamers and, and uh, studios and, and investors. And it was the first version of script that, that basically we financed then. And, and then the, the shootings was set to start, uh, was it uh, September 2021? No, there was of course, only six months to finance the film. That's, a, <laughs> that's not, not a lot of time. Yeah. Oh, especially not when you've got national funders involved. What What is your ratio of like Finnish money to international kind of co-production or, or market money? In yeah, we, were, we were able to get both our public funds involved and also Film Tampere, the third one. And, and uh, so Film Tampere and, and our national incentive, they both were involved. And then, then um, Finnish Film Foundation, that was was uh, around two million together, and then then we sold the distribution rights to uh, Nordic Film. Uh, they handled the Nordic territories, and then and a local uh, streaming service, Seymour and Linear TV, MTV, Game Involved, and then there was this big chunk or rest of the budget we had to finance as a multi-territorial deal or as an equity and as I told before we were able to get bidding war and it was really fun to watch that, <laughs> that situation. yeah but, but you know obviously we were also looking at independent finance through the traditional international mm -hmm. sales model um, but of course that often involves waiting for a film market you know and and is is dependent on the films pre-selling at the film market. So again, we were nervous because we had a project with no film stars. Um, could you pre-sell this title? Was it, mm. those dreaded words, execution dependent? Um, so we had, those, I, we had those conversations. <laughs> you don't have to talk yes, around it. <laughs> we did, we did, and 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 of course, you know, the 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 sales world is 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 a much longer process. So I think. Um, we did ultimately target the kind of one-stop shop financiers who could get us the film made in that time window because the alternative was waiting a whole other year um, to 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 get the lap plan we needed. Mm -hmm. And normally, if you if you need to do pre-selling, you go to Berlin or Cannes Film Festival, and, and I mean, we didn't have time for that, so it, it was like we have to find find one stop. Finance somewhere. Yeah. Um, and how have you found in Finland? I know you've 
been breaking ground in this area for a while, but in terms of I'll put this in, in another context. I'm Canadian. I'm based in Canada. Telefilm Canada has a long-standing reputation of not really valuing films that are commercially oriented. Uh, and I think a lot of funding bodies tend to lean that way, that if something is obviously aiming for kind of a commercial audience, that they tend to say, well, why do you need us? Um, you know, how, how have you found the experience of kind of, or how, put it a different way, obviously you've had success with the funding bodies. Mm -hmm. How did you make the argument that they, these are the sorts of films that funding bodies should be supporting? Yeah, we don't have that problem in Finland. I think uh, they are supporting films that are commercial and, and are art house films and, and uh, and so, so basically, as long as you have a concept that that uh, is good enough, the store, I mean, the whole package has to be good enough that the director, the story, obviously, how you are going to distribute it, and and uh, obviously, there has to be has to have some credibility of producer there as well, production company. So, but anyway, so we are. Our public funds, they, I mean, they are looking for projects that that are, that can travel as well. And obviously, I mean, it, it's important that our domestic market is functioning well, that we are able to do films here that that get get audiences. But it, but I think it, it's uh, nowadays it's it's uh, it's also important that that we do films that that are internationally recognized yeah and i would say that this is one of the big opportunities for the international marketplace as it's getting harder and harder for the american film industry to figure out how to make a movie for for what is economically sensible we don't have the type of subsidies we have regional tax credits or what have you to go to an area and you get 20 30 percent back unlike other countries which really do subsidize the art and making movies as well as being difficult taking a long time is also re really expensive and i think as there's there's so much pressure on the economics of making films in the united states the american distributors are looking elsewhere our most successful movie is a movie todd was involved with this year it's a canadian funded film uh called Blackberry, which is a Canadian story. They are speaking English, of course. Um, but it is a film that was largely funded through stitching together local subsidies. Um, and, you know, that is, I think, where we're going to see a lot of the strong young filmmakers and um, stories come from in areas that our wealth are, are funding the art in a meaningful way is where I think we're going to see some of the best creators come from um, because it just, it, it, it's, it's really the only way to, to stitch together the financing now is through these regional funding bodies that are embracing film in a way that Americans are not right now. It's pure capitalism where we are. Yeah. Um, on that note, I, I want to uh, aware that we're coming a little bit towards the end of our time, but I want to kind of tie that back a little bit, Scott, to something that you touched on very briefly earlier. Um, and in talking about kind of the opportunities going forward um, and, and the place of international film in the overall marketplace. Um, and you made a comment earlier about how you, you think subtitles is becoming less of an issue as, as kind of the, as, as the audience get more, gets more globalized. Um, and this, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few years. And I think partly it's a function of me aging, partly it's a function of my kids aging. Um, and I have a working theory that, that I'd be curious for your thoughts on. Um, and a thing that I realized years ago, my daughter who is just about to turn 18, I realized when she was about 14, 15, I could tell where she was watching TV in the house because she turned the subtitles on for everything, uh, including the English material that she was watching. And, and her tastes are really intensely mainstream. And, and I realized that was not just true for her, that was true for her friends. 
Um, and I think part of what we're seeing right now is the arrival of the actual globally digitally native generation, kids that have grown up in a broadband world their entire life and grown up in social media the entire their entire lives that have had a totally global library of content and access to global creators, whether it's through YouTube or through social media. And, and I've realized certainly with my daughter, one of the things is that because so much of her training in media has come through social media, through her phone, um, everything on socials is, is captioned, all of it, it's subtitled because the creator's assumption is you're gonna encounter it first with the sound off. And she's been trained now in media in a way that her principal way of absorbing information is text and that the audio is actually a supplement. And I've been thinking about that a lot and looking at what you're seeing now on streaming, the idea that like, like Squid Game is not an anomaly anymore or Money Heist or, you know, there was the news this morning that like the Korean, um, I'm blanking on the title of the show, but the, the Korean, like the bodybuilder workout competition show uh, has just been renewed and has become this massive global thing. Um, and, and I'm really thinking like what we're seeing there is those trends of these kids now, they're limited in buying power because they're still too young, but they're, they're now coming into that 18 to 35 demographic that everybody needs. And we're already seeing on streaming that their viewing patterns have changed. And that things like, you know, the things that mom and dad pay for, they're interacting with really, really differently. We don't really know yet how they're gonna spend their own money. But where are you seeing those trends going? Am, am I out of my mind here? Or am I seeing something that that other people are talking about and and, and are seeing coming? Uh, I, I don't think foreign language in America will ever not be an overcome like i don't think there's ever going to be like a night where um a parasite makes more than a marvel movie like I, I i don't see that happening but i think for the reasons you've mentioned and many more um it's a much like it, it's a button on the television now and it wasn't before um i think the fact that it's also worldwide streamers um where Netflix knows within two hours of something going up, not based on what they, you know, their opinion of it, but based on how it's being received, based on how it's being consumed, just from data and analytics, they know how strong the consumers are reacting to it. They know the audiences are, once they're, they turn it on, they're watching all 12 episodes. Like they know that within minutes. So, they can then circulate their best content throughout the world. And then I think there's just things that you see, like when you see RRR in the United States having a fantastic box office, you go and watch RRR and you're like, of course it's doing great. It's got everything in it. It's amazing and it's well done. Who cares if there's some subtitles and not? So I think it's, um tastes are changing as the world gets smaller and um it you know like whereas it you know bollywood style cinema would be foreign to someone before because there was just no way to consume it now like it's not foreign now because so many people can consume it at the click of a few buttons Versus I used to, you know, like have to drive to a certain neighborhood, to a certain video store if I wanted to find a film from a certain area and track it down. And, and Todd, you you came from this world. You know how hard it was to get access to these films. Oh, that yeah, doesn't I, I, exist I all, anymore. All my favorite video shops in Chinatown, big time. But it's that that's like... Film school is a different monster now. I used to have to sit there and show up and wait till 7.30 on a Tuesday night to watch a print roll and hope, you know, like, like it was a, it was appointment viewing that's gone. So I think what that has done is it's kind of like normalized the playing field and quality and great stories and innovative storytelling that like now in a world in the, in the distribution pipeline of a worldwide streamer, they just know it just rises to the top and they're like, oh, this is going to work everywhere. And how do you see that 
how or when do you see that impacting the trends in traditional distribution or is it is it going to do you think um are we in a spot where kind of as that audience ages up does it up the appetite or are we still all just figuring out what new viewing patterns mean i think it depends where like it like audiences still do behave differently in different places yeah and you're thinking like like it, is that purely in a like you're, you're thinking kind of coastal america versus like middle america or country to country or yeah i th I think on the coasts and metropolitan areas it's easier to get people into a theater than it, it may be in a more kind of tertiary or rural area there's just not the theaters so um there's different tastes by region um so uh i i think there's a lot of forces that it's tough to simplify what you're talking about because there's so many nuances to it yeah um that has largely walked me through kind of what i had laid down i would love to um take some more questions if we can um if anybody kind of out watching this, we've got a couple of comments and things. In There's here. a good one at the bottom about the about cinema dying. Future cinema, yeah. <laughs> um, for those who can't see it, uh, from Miro, what are your thoughts on people saying that cinema is dying? People do not go to the movies as much anymore, and streaming services are the new form to consume movies. So, what does the future of the silver screen look like? Well, I think we've lost the teenage audience. And that's, uh, at least that is happening in Finland, that, that uh, uh, those watching films are much older than we want. Basically, these uh, plus minus 20 year old, uh, they don't watch that much uh, films anymore, uh, theatrically. And uh, that's, I think that's a big problem what we have. And maybe that's, uh, uh, that is resulting from a uh, COVID period also. What are your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think COVID changed a lot of viewing habits, didn't it, rather than um, just forcing us to watch movies on Netflix. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always believed that cinema has to be a place where you see excellent films. And I think we, we're not at a, a place where you can just put a mediocre film in the cinema and expect people to show up because I don't think they will. I, I've also discovered recently that cinema is kind of an expensive medium, certainly in the UK where I'm from. And, mm -hmm. and it's not cheap to go to the cinema anymore. It's not a low cost night mm -hmm. out anymore. Um, and, you know, when, when you're faced with this kind of incredible wealth of content at home, um, it better be good. You know, I think Marvel's currently experiencing this with some of their movies is that if they're not good enough, um, you're going to lose your audience. Um, so in the world of independent cinema that we all come from, I think the film has to be really special. I think Sisu is that, Hatching is that too. It's a great, it's a great movie. It's super original, you know, and you've just got to have that extra something, um, have a great distributor like Scott come on to, to help you because, um, it's 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 never been harder, I think, to to make independent film, and it has to be outstanding, or different, or original, or uh, showcasing a great new voice. I yeah. mean, the, people are watching more content than they ever have in the history of time. Yeah. They're just not watching movies, and I think that will change. But it's it's partly because. Um, the reaction is instantaneous now and the second there's no hiding a bad film anymore like the second it's bad and it shows in a theater on a friday afternoon everyone knows the same way everyone knows on a worldwide streaming platform if everything if something is good they know friday afternoon it is good and people like it and they're watching the whole thing so you have to compete with that suddenly if you're a theater, if you're a theater opening a movie on a Friday night, that there's going to be something new at home. I, I think how the streaming world, at least in the United States, is, is playing out right now, which it's going through its own kind of accordion uh, rhythms, 
it's going to affect people and the consumption, but ultimately um, we just try to find good, as to Mike said, he, he hit on the words that I put up on my wall, original, unique, like quality, like that's all we can do is focus on and that will get people back. And film has changed a lot over its hundred plus years. And the pie has expanded and shrunk, but people still, I don't think people woke up one day during COVID and said, we're not going to watch movies anymore. I think how we consume movies has evolved and changed. And it's just understanding that and trying to, as I said earlier, both be reactive, but also lead the, the audience to try and treat film with respect and understand that it's expensive. It's okay to reach into your pocket and say on this movie for $15, I'm going to expect a different experience than if I sat home and gave it to someone who's going to just like, you know, aim a fire hose at my television and I'll just have 200 things that I'm not interested in watching. I think for, for me, what you just said, the key word in all of that is the willingness to pay for experience. That's what I see in, in my kids in a big way is that idea of where they spend the money. Like, um, well, my, my son, uh, our, our older kid is... He's very much my child by <laughs> by personality and everything. He's an obscurist. He likes the the weird, out of the way stuff in big time. Um, and one of the things that I've I've learned watching Will is that Will spends money based on what the experience of it is going to be, rather than the thing. Like my generation, we would buy the thing because we had to. Um, Will pays for the experience. And so it's like really early on, like just latched onto the American remake of The Office and is perfectly happy to watch The Office on his phone because on a base level, he understands that that's about delivery and dialogue and the experience of that show doesn't change by the size of the screen or the environment that you're in. Um, but I was also with him the very first time he ever saw the, um, the trailer for the most recent Mad Max film. And before that was even half over, he was smacking me on the arm saying, we have to see that on the biggest screen possible when it comes out, because he just instantly understood that that is a different experience in a cinema. We experienced that as a company with Mandy, like that thing took off virally and like it was released in a model that wasn't supposed to have really much of a theatrical. There was literally no PNA spent on theatrical. It ended up having a 16 week run in the United States because people just instinctively understood it's different. Um, and that that's an experience worth paying for. And like, I think I've argued for a while that a lot of ex exhibition, the exhibition sector needs to think about independent film the way the music industry thinks about vinyl um and and kind of what that, that audience is and what that experience is because that's what the people want they want something curated they want something that's the highest level they and, and if they have that they're willing to pay for it like you cited parasite earlier parasite played for months at the repertory cinema around from where i live and it was already available digitally but people wanted it in a different way um another question uh, again from Anastasia, um, <laughs> the question of the of the moment as as everybody's going on strike, and this is one of the things that they're talking about. What's your view on AI working in production companies? I heard a very interesting podcast, uh, The Town, which I don't know if it's available worldwide, um, but it was a it's a writer who's on the AI committee at the WGA, and what he was talking about, and it was a fascinating idea is um, that AI essentially takes the average. So when you try to ask AI to write a script, you're going to get the most average version of that script back. You might get something serviceable, but it's going to be average because it has taken everything. So I, I don't know how long that is holds true, but I think it's a tool. It's a tool that's going to change the world. Is it going to replace some people and tasks? Yes. And I think that needs to be regulated, but I think it's how it's used as a tool, not like the people who look at it as a replacement. I don't think it's going to replace certain things. I think it's going to be something that we have to figure out the power of and how to properly use it. Yeah. Um, 
One more quick one from Timo. I think, Mike, this is probably for you, if you can throw your protagonist hat back on um, from those days. Uh, can you talk to your experience on which foreign markets do really well or not so well? Um, in this case, the question is specifically for Finnish films uh, being distributed abroad, but for international <laughs> in general, what are, what are the key markets that really matter? Yeah, I, I did sell a Finnish film actually called Tom of Finland, which was about the iconic um, artist Tom of Finland. But that, you know, that was a very specific, um, it, you know, it's a brand, the Tom of Finland brand, and we, you know, we sold very widely across the world. Um, and I just saw the new Aki Charismaki film in Cannes, which, you know, likewise, I think will sell everywhere. But, the, the, you know, Aki is his own brand as well, you know, and, and his films are are kind of um, world-class films. So I think, you know, Finnish cinema is like most national cinemas. It has it has exciting, well-known directors that have a, a global fan base among, in the distribution community. It has um, films that will always travel if they're distinctive enough or they have IP or brand that, that, that has global recognition. Um, or, you know, most excitingly, it's the hatchings of the world, which are brand new, filmmakers that managed to explode out of a out of a film festival a, an a-list film festival um and then and then a director like yamri you know he was that he was that guy in 2010 with rare exports yeah festivals play a large part in this don't they yeah can you can you talk through like just quickly in in general terms what are, what are the key markets that really matter if people are trying to plan out what they well, should be looking at? You know, Scott, I assume you saw Hatching at Sundance. I mean, it, it starts at Sundance in January, goes into Berlin, Cannes, um, Venice, Toronto um, in in September, August, September. And and those are the film, those are the festivals, I suppose they're called A-list film festivals, where you can really explode with a film um, onto the consciousness of, of a US distributor, onto the consciousness of US agents who want to suddenly um, sign up the director. Um, they're the most well attended festivals um, for everybody in the global industry. And I think I think you know that that you know as as rare exports, I think was Toronto, wasn't it, Petri? Yeah, it was Toronto. Yeah. Madness. Toronto, Toronto Midnight. As well, world premiere. And I was, no, I was in that screen. There are were you were there are fantastic there are fantastic um, programmers and curators who who are no doubt watching every Finnish film and um, evaluating whether these films will go to these festivals. Those are the people to know, clearly. Yeah. And I mean, in country-wise in general, like the for, for Timo, um, the specific markets that you're targeting that typically are the high value ones, the big three are Germany, France, and UK historically, although UK is... UK is a bit shit these okay. days, isn't it? Um, um, and North America, of course, you know, is is yeah. a big destination for for non English films, yeah. non English language films. And then after that, you're looking at like Benelux, Spain, Italy, and it declines quickly from there. Australia, yeah. I mean, there are there are territories around the world that are kind of meaningful. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? We're over our initial hour. I know at least, oh, here we go. Um, I agree with that. That's more of a comment than a question, um, but kind of reiterating some of what Scott was saying about yeah, using AI as a tool. Um, well, this is great. I think if we are good to go, we can probably close up there. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Timo, and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. You were amazing, and I didn't expect any less. I did have a couple of questions, but I do know that we need to need to run, but maybe I could ask one. Oh, yeah. If, if people yes. are good to stay. Yes. Okay. Uh, because I know that there are a lot of students and newcomers in the industry in the audience. I, I know a couple of them personally. I ask a question to Scott just briefly. Uh, what is your professional background and how did you get in that position? Like, how did you start off and how did you end up as a head of acquisition? 
Um, I started off as a clerk in a video store with a good foreign film section and watched and read as much as I could and then went off to film school, um, went off to a couple of them, uh, started as an assistant. I, I thought when I was at film school, I thought I was going to be a writer and a director. And then someone told me that you could actually get paid to just watch the movies. And I was like, that sounds like an even better job than having to making, <laughs> make them. So um i got into acquisitions worked at one studio for a long time worked at another studio for a long time left to go to television and realized i missed movies and and came back <laughs> right right yeah thank you that, that that was all from me just wanted one career career case here because i know there are youngsters on the line okay but thank you, thank you, Mike, thank you, Scott, thank you, Petri, and thank you, Top. This was this was amazing, and uh, yeah, you will get recording both panelists and both the participants. Film Tambra, thank you all, and have a great evening or great day. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. I guess. <laughs>